and welcome to your real estate show with thanks to Harcourts. My name is Rachel Williams and I'm excited to be with you again tonight. We've got a great show lined up for you from rental stress to what's happening across retail and restaurants in Hobart that makes the capital city such a great place to live. We've also got an exciting look through an amazing new build to talk about interior design trends. And to start off tonight, we visit St Helens, where we look through an amazing property that's set to set a new residential benchmark. Today we're going to be blown away by something special at St Helens. We're at 215 Binalong Bay Road. Hello Heidi Howe from Harcourt St Helens. Thank you for having us here. It's my pleasure Rachel. Thank you for coming. This is a beautiful property. Tell me about it. It's a four bedroom, two bathroom home. Obviously architecturally designed. It has a 180 degree view of the bay which you just cannot lose. Um, it's designed to be lived in. It's so low maintenance and that kitchen Wait till you see it. I am looking forward to that, given we spend half our lives there. And it's on 10 acres as well, so it's a really family friendly block. Very much so, yeah, designed to be lived in, as I say. So the whole property. I'm going to take a look through and I'll see you on the other side. Sounds good. Thank mm -hmm. you. You immediately get the sense this place is easy to live in. Polished concrete floors throughout with underfloor heating, children's wing up one side, and walking into this amazing kitchen living area. Well, have I found us a place of sanctuary from the master bedroom and walk-in robe into this ensuite. The view from the big window is amazing with the bath, double-headed shower for his and her, and a beautiful vanity with a private toilet. I love how these sliding doors give a real privacy to the second living area, which is currently used as a children's playroom. I really love the light and shade that this kitchen offers. Really nice recessed refrigerator and appliances right through to a walk-in butler's pantry. This lounge area is really spacious. You can certainly imagine the family laying on the floor in front of the fire watching the TV or simply looking out at the beautiful view to the water and the bushland behind. Well, Heidi, I've literally been blown away by how beautiful this place is. I understand it's going to set a record for the residential market in the area. It is. It's going on the market today, Rachel, for $1.8 million and we're expecting a lot of interest from mainland buyers and those looking for the ultimate lifestyle property. Well, it certainly is that. If you're interested and want to have a look through, give Heidi Howe a call at Harcourt St Helens. Yeah, it was a pretty special property indeed. Well, we're now going to mix things up a bit for your region section with thanks to homely.com.au. We're now joined in the studio by Hobart personality Alex Johnston, who's a great promoter of all things cultural and cuisine when it comes to our capital city. Hello, Alex. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Ranch. Great now, to be mic'd up with you again. It's wonderful to be back on, on camera with you after... Knowing one another for 20 years, and I know you've lived in Hobart for nearly 18 of those, can you believe how much the capital city has changed and developed over those years? Yeah, it's just extraordinary. I moved to Hobart at the start of 2003, and I guess in my mind I was going to be there for a couple of years and go exploring, but it's incrementally uh, just been a better and better place to live, and a lot of that is about where to eat and drink 
and obviously I'm giving no clues <laughs> away. I like doing both. So Well, we like to speak to the experts on this show, so you are the man for that. Let's just take a quick look, though, at what has actually happened from a price perspective. Back in 2000, the median house price was just $120,000, which is hard to believe when you actually compare it to 2020 prices. The median there is $782,000 pretty significant. Yeah, just extraordinary. I mean, my mum bought a house at just the absolute sweet spot, which is now worth more than double what she paid for at about the same time I moved there. So yeah, it's just gone gangbusters. And I think it's because Hobart's such an attractive destination. Um, we know all about the Mona effect and that had an influx of visitors, but it's also given people clues as to, gee, this would be a nice place to live and work. And I think that's the key as well. It's a great place to, to work because you're never too far away from where you're based. And tell us about that restaurant um, culture. Like it has been so well documented that there are so many amazing places that people love to go and, and visit and then they decide to end up living here. Yeah, I think it's been a, a destination that chefs have wanted to work in. Um, coinciding with Mona opening. I think that we've always had great produce, but now it's so much easier to tell our story. Social media came along at the same time as Hobart was a, a sort of a, a destination. And that's really helped because now if you've got something great to offer, it's so easy to tell a lot of people about it and good places get rewarded. And then there's strength in numbers. Good places breed other great restaurants. There's no um, danger in setting up shop next to another great restaurant. In fact, it's a blessing because if they're full, they'll come to you. So we've seen that happen across the city, little nooks and crannies with multiple great places to eat. And a real growth in that boutique wine bar and, and brewery type business as well. Yeah, uh, there's there seems to be no shortage of an appetite for Tasmanian booze. And that's because if you're here for the weekend, you want to drink Tassie beer. You want to meet the person who makes it. So if you can set up a shop front where you give customers that opportunity to meet the person who's brewed it and tell them what hops they put in it, so much better than just cracking a can of something generic. So yeah, I think and the premium price is something that um, we've been prepared to uh, put on our products as well and it yeah. hasn't slowed us down. No. And so what do you see as uh, into the future, some of those key developments and infrastructure projects that are currently taking place that will no doubt make Tassie or Hobart in particular an even more livable place? Yeah, so we've seen the Midtown area really pop up and that's sort of this between the CBD and the North Hobart Strip, which was always popular. Now those centre blocks, it's got the uni accommodation on Elizabeth Street and around that is retail and bars and restaurants. And so that's an exciting place. I still think that's a long way away from reaching its potential. Um, you've got hotels setting up and they're sort of breeding little restaurants around them. They come with their own restaurants often, but little shops around those and they're in sort of the extremities of the CBD. And then the big one's gonna be Macquarie Point. I mean, it should have, <laughs> <laughs> been, uh, there should be more action down there by now, yep. but eventually it'll be transformed into something special that'll complement the waterfront so well. Yep. And the waterfront's just timeless, you know, that Salamanca Strip yep. never gets boring. So by the looks of things, property prices are only going to go one way then? I imagine. I mean, you're the real estate expert, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, there's always going to be good places to eat and drink. And I think people think about that. Moon is a great place because there's great restaurants around it. I'm living at Kingston. It's great places to eat down by the beach. People do think about food and to a lesser extent, booze, <laughs> when they pick where they want to live. Well, a way to a man's heart's through his stomach, so perhaps that's the way to their real estate as well. I would imagine. Wonderful, thank you so much for your time today, Alex. Well, that was Alex Johnston joining us there with our homely.com.au regional profile. And next, we're going to talk rental matters. Well, with such a boom in property prices comes pressure from a political point of view when it comes to the rental market. We're joined now by Louise Elliott, the president of the Tasmanian Rental Property Owners Association. Hello to you, Louise. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now, you represent 150 odd landlords from across the state. Can you give us a little bit of a, an indication and understanding about the real financial and emotional impact of what that COVID moratorium on rental increases had for those people? Well, unsurprisingly, our association covers the full spectrum of landlords, everyone from people who own one property through to people that own multiple properties. And the experience has uh, been diverse too. We've had people who are largely unaffected and just having their fingers crossed through to people who have been really badly burnt, both financially and emotionally. 
um, people that have over $10,000 in rent arrears owed to them. Thankfully, a large proportion that has been cleared by the government, but not all. Um, but then also coincided with that was not only rent arrears, but people um, coming across property damage because we had a period where there was no inspections allowed. So unfortunately, the people who got burnt, they typically got burnt very badly. Yeah, right. So a lot's been made uh, in the media about unfair rent hikes um, after that moratorium ended. Is that um, a, a fair claim, do you think? Are they true that there have been some um, substantial rate hikes that aren't really warranted? Well, everyone's um, version of what substantial is subjective, obviously, but it's important to not um, assume that we know the full story just by reading the front cover of a book. So, for example, a lot of people, a lot of rental owners haven't put their rent up for years and prices creep over time. So, of course, it can be a shock and we understand that to have a big jump in your rent. But that's often because, and mostly because, the rents have been kept at a lower level. So we're actually advising our members to, when they're keeping the rent forced and not actually following the market rate, is to be clear with the tenant around what the actual market rate for the property is versus what the tenant is actually paying. Because it's critically important to a property owner to keep a good tenant. And a big way to do that is to stabilise the rent. But that can mean that when it is time for the rent to reach the market price, that it can be a shock. So it all comes down to that communication then because I was going to ask like how do you actually advise landlords about what is reasonable and, and responsible? Yeah, well, we advise landlords, um, people who are informed about this, I mean, do your own research, obviously understand what the market rent is, take advice from your agent if you use one, but then remember that ultimately the decision is yours. You don't have to increase rent, but I will be open and transparent with your tenant if you're not um, to avoid those shocks further down the line. Fair enough. And just finally, um, the fight against land tax, it's an age old one. And obviously with um, budgets and elections coming up, what, um, what's an alternative that you can suggest if the government wants to remove that? Well, uh, we're not delusional in thinking it'll be removed anytime soon. We are, of course, carefully watching other states and what they're doing because we are heavily taxed with stamp duty, land tax, capital gains. So, of course, that whole needs to look at much more um, collectively. But we put a submission into the Premier Treasurer and we're recommending that they most definitely not just look at the rates and thresholds because you're right, land tax in Tasmania is extreme. When you graph it out, it's visually quite disturbing the amount we pay. And the higher the land tax is, the higher rents will go. There is a correlation there. Um, so what we're suggesting is that they cap increases to minimise that bill shock. They look at different rates for owners, whether a property is owned by an Australian person or body versus overseas ownership. That's a no-brainer to us. And then they also look at overhauling the transparency of the process because the relationship between the value of general and your land tax, so people can get shocked that way. And that they also consider allowing not just the principal place of residency to be tax-free, land tax-free, but also one other property. Because the bulk of our membership, that's what they have. They have um, small number of properties, which is their retirement nest egg. And the more still self-sufficient retirees we have, the less pension the government has to pay out. Yep. Sounds like you've got it all sorted. Thank you so much for your time today, Louise. We must get you on again in the future to perhaps go into a bit more depth about those issues with bad tenants and bonds and, and some advice that you might have with that respect. We'd welcome that. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Louise. Well, earlier this year, we met up with nationally acclaimed interior designer, uh, Lydia Maskill, who showed us some interior design trends for this coming year. We were lucky enough to go through one of her recently completed projects, which is already winning national acclaim. Let's take a look at the Santorini project with thanks to Snooze Launceston. Today I'm at the spectacular Santorini property designed by Honed Architecture. I'm going to be catching up with Lydia Maskeel who had the privilege of the interior design of this amazing property. We're going to take a step through this beautiful door with views to the Tamar Valley and go and meet her inside. Well, 
Lydia sitting here in front of what was Australia's Kitchen of the Year for 2020. Congratulations. Tell us about the design process with it. Oh, thank you. So I guess we've designed the kitchen to the proportions of the space. So we've used line work in the cabinetry that really draw your eye up and create that sense of height. Because it is an open plan living, it is designed for a large family. We've used light pendants that have acoustic panels in them to, to really absorb some of that, that sound yes, that's noisy that sound. Flood through the space. <laughs> And I guess with this property, it is all about the views. It is heavily glazed and we've created a series of frame, frames throughout the space, which is a key concept. Um, so it actually is a framework around the lunar concrete Essa stone, which is actually counterbalanced by the stone used in the island. And there's a lot of timber detailing, which is really quite subtle and a nice detail that we've carried through the kitchen. And then is picked back up through the Chevron wine rack, um, which really draw you through to the pantry. It certainly does make you want to go into that butler's pantry. Yeah. And this um, middle section as well, a really good um, delineator of the two spaces. Absolutely. And I think with open plan hubs, you need to find that delineation um, between the spaces. So. This is perfect for, for creating that subtle separation between your living and your dining space um, and gives you that flexibility of seating that you can engage in your dining space, you can swivel around um, and, and engage in the living space as well. And I love that it's really light, but then you have this feature wall with the cabinetry around the, the TV that's so different. So again, that's picking up that framing concept that we were that's carried through the kitchen and using the same sort of line work, we've done that in a darker colour so that the TV just disappears, it doesn't need to be a focal point to the room and really does keep the focus on the views. And as you say, those views, beautiful curtains and fabrics with the furnishings that you've chosen as well, how important is that for a space? Absolutely, especially in this zone where, where the views are the key feature. Floor to ceiling um, translucent shears are perfect for this because you still get that, that concept of the, the view. Um, again, draws your eye up and then having flexible seating arrangement works really well that you can sort of manoeuvre between the spaces. And a really beautiful colour palette. Yes, soft, neutral. Again, it's not too obtrusive. No, it's certainly spectacular. And this area is going to be in Home Beautiful magazine next month. So you've had a sneak peek here on The Real Estate Show. Thank you so much for bringing us through. Thank you, Rachel. That's all we have time for tonight. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.